now we're in business. Sorry that you don't get me in video, but it's 10 o'clock in the morning here, and now I'm looking it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> Right, you guys welcome to the jungle room youtube channel i am jamie k and here with me again is ian mckay and we had a great conversation last week and there was still so much that we wanted to talk about yeah. all your great stories that we had to have you back so welcome yeah. oh well i'm glad to be with you again jamie all right okay so let's start back with the story you were eager to tell us, but we ran out of time. Let's start there. It's probably, I think that, I think the fans are probably, you know, the, the aspect of the obvious scene uh, I like most. I mean, there's not much more to learn about parts of Elvis's life that we don't know about. And uh, to me, what the fans did is, is fascinating. Um, I've got a, uh, when I when we went to see Elvis in '77, as I said last last time, we uh, there was a, a bunch of young fans, and I hadn't really kept in touch with people. Uh, yet out of the blue, I think it was six years ago, I got in touch with my friends Shirley, Jim, and uh, Marion from Newcastle in Sunderland, in the northeast of of England, and it was great getting in touch with them and we met up the, the, those of us who went together to, to see Elvis, we met up again. It was great. And one of the things that Shirley kept, she kept the passenger list from the fan club trip. We were all given the passenger list so that we could in theory, um, decide to share a room with people and, and make it, uh, make it cheaper. Um, but, uh, she still had the passenger list from 1977. And she actually sent it to me and she said, do you realize there's uh, two names on this that are, that are really in the county you live in, in Fife? Um, you know, I thought it was quite interesting, she said. And of course, I had to try and get in touch with the people. And it was amazing because, uh, you know, from, a, from then, it was what, uh, 37 years ago, 38 years before, I, got, I tried to get in touch with the person. And amazingly, about a month later, somebody answered. And this was a guy, Jimmy McNally, uh, from Fife. And I was fascinated because, of course, I went to see him. And when you come away from, from seeing these, from seeing fans, you just feel so exuberant. You feel, you feel when you hear their stories, it just gets me, it gets you so excited to be an Elvis fan again. And I remember coming away from Jimmy and immediately having to call Shirley, my friend that sent me the passenger list, and just having to go over his stories. Because this guy was, uh, he, he's an ordinary guy, uh, ordinary, ordinary job in Fife. And incredibly, and it was so unusual for people in the early 70s to go to America, never mind to go and see Elvis in Vegas. But Jimmy went to see Elvis in Vegas in 73. And also Jimmy went to see Elvis in 75. And believe it or not, Jimmy also went to see Elvis in 77. And incredibly, and I think I mentioned this last thing, what happened was Jimmy was walked across the screen. As I was walking past the screen being filmed by CBS, Jimmy walks past. And so literally when I went to Jimmy's house, we watched this and he said, that's me there. And I said, well, that's me over there. And so that was in 77. But in 75, Jimmy's story was, was pretty special. That he's, the main story I wanted to talk about was actually in 73, but 75 is, is fascinating because Jimmy went over, like, like most fans, to see Elvis in Vegas, and they went to Nashville. And when he was in Nashville, uh, they were due to fly to Vegas the next morning. And what happened was the Elvis fan club, the UK fan club, came and said, look, the, the flight's full for tomorrow, so does anyone want to travel tonight? And Jimmy said, yeah, I'll go. There was another guy he went with. I think there was only three of them went. And they landed in Vegas. They landed in Vegas about midnight. And this guy had been to see Elvis before and said, look, there's a midnight show on. And we can probably get into it if you want. And so Jimmy said, yeah, why not? Because he said, the sweet inspiration will be on just now. So by the time we get there, Elvis will just be coming on. And so they got a taxi straight to the Hilton. 
and literally the the bride, sorry, the uh, paid the paid the merchant to get them in, and so they went in, and they were the only people that saw Elvis in the fan club uh, that season because that was the last show Elvis did before he was sick, and so you know uh, Jimmy saw Elvis in '75 in Vegas, and hardly anybody else did, and that was that was a fascinating story in itself. But when it came to 1973, uh, he started talking about 1973. And he started, I was in his house, and of course, he showed me the pictures and he said, This is the fan club trip in 73. And really, that was the first time that the, the fan club had been to the US, um, mm-hmm. 72, 73. And what happened was, uh, Jimmy was, Jimmy met Elvis. Jimmy met Elvis. Oh, wow. That's an absolutely fascinating story. Jimmy met Elvis. And, uh, and I knew a guy, because I'd gone, I mentioned last time that we had gone to the Glasgow fan club, now called the Elvis Touch. Then it was the Rock and Elvis fan club. And I met a guy called Robert Maxwell. And Robert Maxwell was the ultimate cool guy. I think I mentioned last time he was a really cool guy. And Robert had met Elvis. And there's a picture of Robert. And I'd found it in the New Musical Express. And uh, I don't know if I should show you the picture, actually, Jamie. I should show you the picture, at least. Yeah. And so Robert's over this side, and there's there's Elvis. There's Elvis getting a trophy, and over this side, on that side of the picture, right in the corner is Robert. And so Robert, uh, that was a picture I'd seen. Robert, Robert meeting Robert meeting Elvis, along with Todd Slaughter presenting him with the Musical Express Award um, for the best entertainer in nineteen seventy two, I think it was. And so I knew about Robert, but then I didn't know about Jimmy. And so Jimmy said, he told me the story and how he'd met Elvis and everything. And then he said, do you know a guy called Robert Maxwell? And I said, yeah, I know Robert. He said, I met him, I met him with Robert. And I went, really? And he said, yeah, yeah, we met him together. And uh, he told me how he'd done it. And for years and years and years, I wondered who the guy at the back of the picture was. So the guy that's at the back of the picture, I thought, who's that guy? The guy that's actually behind Elvis. And that's Jimmy. That's Jimmy. That's Jimmy. Jimmy McNally from Fife. And what happened was, of course, Jimmy said, do you know Robert? I said, yeah, I know Robert. I see Robert every month. I got the fan club dances in Glasgow. And of course, right away, I had to put these guys together. Because they'd actually met all this together. But the story of how they met was just amazing. Because the fan club, what they did was they said, you guys share a room because you're from Scotland. So they were actually sharing a room. They shared the room in Nashville, then they went to Vegas, and they shared the room in, in, in Vegas. And so Robert was, he ran the fan club in Glasgow. He ran the Rocky Elvis fan club. And so Robert was in, the, was in the, the Hilton. Jimmy was in the Hilton. So Jimmy bumped into Conor Parker. Conor Parker was playing the fruit machines. And Jimmy walked up to the Colonel and said, excuse me, sir, are you Colonel Parker? And Jimmy tells the story far better than I could. And his exact words, I am that. And so Jimmy proceeded to then tell the Colonel how much of a fan he was, how he was, his whole family had loved the Elvis in the 50s. They were great fans. And wouldn't it, be, it would be great if I could just get the opportunity to meet Elvis. Now, I would never occur to me to ask that, but Jimmy asked that. And so the Colonel said, uh, all right, um, Go and tell, uh, go around to my office around the corner and uh, tell the man in there that Colonel said it was okay for you to meet Elvis. Mind you, I'm not promising anything, but um, so Jimmy walks around the corner, meets Tom Diskin. Tom Diskin's in the office, and Tom says, Well, come back about such and such a time, come back at this time. And he said, Oh, that's great. So, of course, Jimmy goes back to his room, and Robert's sitting in the room. Now, Jimmy couldn't possibly tell Robert about this. Mm-hmm. Couldn't possibly tell Robert about this because Robert would, of course, have told everyone. And then it might have spoiled it for Jimmy. So Jimmy, sitting there, Robert goes down, goes into the casino, and Robert walks straight into um, Tom Diskin's office, the uh, uh, Colonel's office, with his fan club presence card. So he's got a fan club presence card. And he said, uh, excuse me, I'm Robert Maxwell from the Rocky Elvis fan club in Scotland. Come all the way from Scotland. Is there any chance I could get to meet Elvis? And um, and uh, Tom Diskin said, "What? Well, this is you, the president. They said, yeah, that's me, the president. He said, well, 
there's a bunch of uh, UK fans coming along at such and such a time. Why don't you come along too? And uh, so Robert arranges this, and Robert goes back to the room, doesn't say a word to Jimmy. <laughs> so doesn't say a word to Jimmy. So then later on in the night, of course, Jimmy leaves to go to the show, and Robert leaves to go to the show. And what happens is Jimmy gets into the colonel's office and meets him, and uh, Tom Diskins says, right, okay, this man will take you backstage just now. And this is Ed Bonger. Ed Bonger, the famous Elvis photographer, who, who just died not long ago, actually. And so Ed Bonger starts taking Jimmy backstage at the Hilton. Big signs everywhere, no cameras, no cameras. And so Jimmy, Jimmy stops Ed and says, excuse me, I've got a camera with me. I've got a camera. And uh, Ed says, ah, it's okay, don't worry, you're with me, you're fine. So they go backstage. In the meantime, Robert Maxwell arrives along with Todd Slaughter and the UK fan club party. The UK fan club party was all arranged beforehand, and they didn't know that Robert had got the okay to go as well. So the UK fan club party wasn't too happy that Robert had got this special, uh, special deal with the, the Tom Diskins. So but they took him along with them. So they then go backstage as well. In the meantime, Jimmy has been introduced to Elvis, walking towards him with Red West and everybody. Jimmy's on his own, completely on his own. Um, standing there with Ed Bonja, Elvis comes up, shakes his hand, hello, you know, and uh, he just spent time talking to Elvis. At that point, round the corner comes a UK fan club group. Swedish guys to present Elvis with a gold record, uh, Todd Slaughter with the presentation of the trophy, and of course, Robert Maxwell as well. So there we are. And what happens is, Todd Slaughter, who's the fan club boss, this is presenting the trophy, Todd Slaughter says, what are you doing here? <laughs> to Jimmy. And of course, Jimmy says, oh, I met Elvis. And at one point, now that's, that's not the photograph, but there's another photograph where Elvis is actually turning and talking to Jimmy. He actually turns and talks to Jimmy. And it's blocked by Ian Bailey, one of the guys from the fan club. And Ed Bonja took, uh, took pictures, and Jimmy's got other pictures. But, of course, they then got the show and whatever. And they got, go back to the hotel room that night. And uh, he said, Robert, he said, I didn't know you were going to see Elvis. Jimmy, I didn't know you were going to see Elvis. So, of course, it was incredible. Two guys from Scotland, totally by chance, had both met Elvis around the same picture. And after, I don't know, 40 years of me having seen that picture, I then found out that Jimmy McNally was actually the guy standing, up, standing at the back. And for years, Robert didn't have a copy of that picture. And I managed to get him a copy from the New Musical Express, and Jimmy didn't have it either. And needless to say, in 2014, I got them together. They went to the Elvis Dance in Glasgow that night, and I took them to dinner beforehand. And I wrote down the story, which is why it's embedded in my head now. I wrote this down for the Glasgow Fan Club uh, magazine. And it's probably one of the best Elvis stories because it's from one country, because of the unlikely nature of it, because it's two ordinary guys, and uh, because they both met, uh, met Elvis at the same time. That is incredible. Oh, my goodness. Now, did they tell you anything about how Elvis was with them? Yeah, especially Jimmy. Um, Robert had talked to me. I started, I think as I mentioned last time, I started going to the fan club in Glasgow when I was 16. And I didn't know that Robert met Elvis. And I got a bunch of clippings from, uh, from someone, a friend of my mother's, who was a fan, but was giving away all these press clippings, she'd say. And suddenly I saw a picture of Robert in the corner. I couldn't believe it. This is the guy I met in, 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 uh, in Glasgow, the fan club. So I went, of course, I asked Robert, uh, tell me about him. And so I heard, you know, Robert, Robert's story. I'd heard Robert's story and 40 years before I heard um, Jimmy's story. But Robert had said he was just a gentleman. He was very nice and very gracious about accepting the trophy and whatever. And it sounded pretty much like the press report, because that's actually a press report from the, like, the newspaper, the New Musical Express. But then when you heard Jimmy's story, I mean, he's one-to-one -one with Elvis. He's, Elvis is ready to go on stage. Suddenly Jimmy's in front of him and he's no idea who Jimmy is. And suddenly he's talking to Jimmy and he was just lovely, as Jimmy said, because of course Jimmy didn't know what, he just started spouting out the whole time. I've been a fan forever. My family loves you. I love you. We love your music. We love your albums, you know? And uh, he said Elvis was just a lovely guy. Shook his hands, didn't talk to him. 
So my half a second with Elvis, given the Elvis and family, and Jimmy got three minutes, which is which is mm-hmm. fabulous. It's funny because last time when we talked, you asked me, um, you know, what could Elvis fans do now, and I, I think I, I think the most important thing is you try and walk a bit in Elvis's shoes. You try and go places that Elvis went. Um, you you try and understand his upbringing. You try and understand his music. Uh, you know that's the most important thing. I, I assure you that if you've been to see Elvis on the big video screens, Elvis the concert. If you've been to see that, that's probably that's probably pretty much the same as you would have seen Elvis. You know, from most auditoriums, from most of the seats in the auditoriums, that's pretty much you would see. So that is a real Elvis experience. A crowd that's really enthusiastic when you're watching Elvis in the big video screen. If the crowd's really into it, that's exactly what it was like in the Elvis shows. Right? That's that's the most important thing. Don't think that because you weren't there at the time that you lost it out. You know, look at the pictures. You know, look at the pictures that you can they can find online. Um, start start understanding Elvis's life. Try and try and understand the the, the juxtaposition, if you like, of. Elvis the entertainer versus Elvis the real thinker. Elvis the, who, who at times thought he could make the clouds move. Um, try and put that in context. Try and understand how he got to that point. Try and understand how you know um, these guys that surrounded him just constantly reinforced what he said. But also try and, try and find out, try and establish your own um, relationship with Elvis. I always say I've got a relationship with Elvis. And, Try and establish your own relationship with Elvis, whether it's just whether you just idolise him, or whether, and I think a lot of cases, and there's a lot, of, there's a lot of um, a lot of Elvis fans to you know who are physically handicapped, who have um, you know love the guy, they love the guy, and we we used to have quite a lot of guys in wheelchairs that came to our dances, and they loved Elvis because Elvis was this fabulous dynamic guy, and who they could look up to. And you get you get ordinary people who've got ordinary jobs like me, who look at him and think, my relationship with Elvis is he gives me that, he gives me that in my life. You know, some people are religious and they see the Elvis's religious side. You know, but the most important thing is establish your own relationship with Elvis. That's the most important thing, because Elvis is yours. He doesn't belong to whoever Elvis Presley Enterprises are called, but he doesn't belong to them. He belongs to you. That's the most important thing. Elvis has always had, I've always had a relationship with Elvis that is unique to me. And uh, hopefully younger fans can establish that too. So we've heard your stories about um, being in the audience at the Elvis concerts, being in the CBS special. Have you met any of the individuals in the Elvis world? Yeah, lots. Um, Lots and lots and lots. Um, My friend Julian, my friend Julian Grant, who lives in Cambodia, you should ask Julian to be on your show at the moment. Okay. So the last time I spoke to him, he's collecting every single candid of Elvis and dating it. So he's building up a, a library of every single candid. So I think that's a, a fantastic job that he's doing so that future generations can, you know, we know where this was, etc. But I mean, I've met Charlie Hodge, I've met Vernon, I've met everybody. I mean, basically, is there anyone I've not met? Uh, I met all the stamps. Uh, I met George Klein, obviously. I met Sam Phillips. I met Knox Phillips, who just died. Um, met all the Jordanaires. Mm-hmm. I met Red, Sonny, uh, Mark Lacker, Alan Fortas. I met Alan Fortas, and Alan was the first of the Metro's Mafia to die, I think he was. I met Gene Smith. I met Billy, obviously. I uh, met Jerry Schilling. I think some of the some of the unusual people. Uh, I've got to tell you this. One. I mean, meeting all these guys was just great. My mate Julian, as I say, he's met far more far more people than I have. Uh, funnily enough, I've not met the Sweet Inspirations. I've not met them. No, I've not met them. I don't think I have met them. And uh, obviously, there's well, there's only one left now. But uh, I pretty much met a lot of other people. But the people that fascinate me are, and I don't think um, uh, there's a there's a place called Marietta in Arkansas. Mariana, sorry, Mariana. And one of the things that I love to do, Jamie, is I love to go places where Elvis was. And so Mariana, Arkansas, Elvis performed there, I think, in 55 at the high school. And so, of course, uh, I had to go. And so my long-suffering wife, uh, as we drove 
down through Arkansas one more time in, in the pursuit of Elvis sites. We get to Mariana and I find the high school. And the high school is no longer there. The high school was demolished years ago. And if you go to Mariana, Arkansas, it's an example of a beautiful southern town where the industry's gone, so basically the people have gone. Uh, but it's beautifully preserved, and the town square is beautifully preserved. And I was walking around, and the high school, there was only a few steps left, that's all I could find. And then we were just about to drive away, and there was an, a, a really old woman who was, was uh, I don't know how she was managing it, because she was carrying this hose and, and uh, watering flowers that were that were uh, um, just decorating the uh, the centre of the, the town square, if you like. And I went up to her and said, you know, are you, what are you doing? I'm from Scotland and isn't that fascinating? And I started to talk to her and she said, what brings you to Mariana? I said, uh, I said, oh, came to see Elvis, uh, where Elvis performed. And she said, oh, the high school was all uh, demolished years ago. She said, oh, right, right. Okay. And she said, I was a teacher at it. I said, yeah. She said, yeah. She said, I was here the night Elvis performed there. And of course, this fabulous old lady that was looking after her town with her hose, and she had actually been there the night Elvis was there. Wow. Now, I just, I just love that. Mm -hmm. And I went to uh, Helena, Helena, Arkansas. Now, if you go to Helena, if you're, not, if you're not American, you don't understand racial division, but I don't. In Scotland, it's, you know, you just don't get that. And when I went to Helena, which is an amazing place because the bridge goes from Helena right across to uh, Mississippi. And there's, a, I think it's, I think it's a, something like Highway 47 or 17, there's got seven in it anyway. But it's right, right next to Mississippi or right next to the, the river. Um, but Helena is pretty much demolished. And West Helena, which is, uh, which was built later, they pretty much moved the town over to West Helena, which is, I mean, just, only America would do that, but that's what it's like. And I went there because the Catholic club in Helena, they always performed there twice. And of course, it was uh, Bill Burke, the former journalist who wrote some fantastic books. Uh, Bill and I were friendly. In fact, that's where I actually saw the, this uh, Elvis Levi's t-shirt first. Mm -hmm. That was the first uh, time I saw that was uh, Bill Burke had one. And um, my friend Julian again introduced me to, uh, to Bill. Um, and Bill had written about Helena. And so I took off to go and see Helen, maybe 10 years ago now. And it was the, I know what it was, it was the 50th anniversary of, of it. So it was 2005, my goodness, 15 years ago. And what had happened was I just went, I went down there and I went to a Catholic club and of course it was closed. It was a, it, I didn't realize it was actually part of this uh, church hall, effectively, the church hall. And so I went, I tried looking in, tried looking from the back, whatever tried to see in. And of course, what happened was eventually the, the priest came out and saw me. And I, I said, you're an Elvis fan, aren't you? I said, yes. <laughs> because he said, of course, he had other crazy Elvis fans doing the same. So of course, he showed me in. He took me in. And uh, he took me in and he told me about the stage. He said, we had a fire over there. So half the stage was, we had to rebuild that. But that was where Elvis stood. And uh, he said, you weren't here for the 50th anniversary, were you? I said, no, I wasn't. He said, he said, oh, it's fascinating. Now, I can't remember the guy's name, but I always refer to him as Bubba. He said, well, it was, you want to go down to Hardware Store, and Bubba organized it. And, um, and I said, really? He said, yeah, Bubba was here in 1955. At the, both the concerts, in fact, he promoted one of them. And so Bubba in the Hardware Store. And so, of course, what did I do? I then go and see Bubba. So I go down and see Bubba, and he wasn't there at first. I had to go back. And he was an old guy, but he was so cool. And he was the guy that actually organized at least one of the shows, and he was at both the shows, and uh, it was just fabulous to talk to. And I mean, yeah, you just you you can't uh, you can't cut price on that. It's just utterly fabulous. Um, but I mean, as I said last time, I, I lived in New Jersey, so of course, what, what was the first thing I did was bought the book. You know, well these are all the other sites. So you go to the Steve Allen show, um, where the Hudson Theatre, where in New York City, where uh, where Steve Allen show was filmed. And it was radically different. And my daughter remembers this very well because if somewhere says it's closed, to Ian McKay, that doesn't really mean it's closed. 
<laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't really, yeah. really mean anything. When it comes to Elvis and me, it's like, I've got a relationship with Elvis. And there's a famous, famous scene, right? it's not a famous scene, but it's a theme in Follow That Dream, the movie Follow That Dream. And, and Elvis says, Elvis says uh, you know, in fact, it's Arthur Conway that says it, Elvis' his dad, he says, we are not the public. And I always say that, close to the public, well, we're not the public, <laughs> you know. And so I'm not, I'm not the public, I'm an Elvis fan. So that gives me the right to barge into anywhere I want. So I got into the Steve Allen, got into the Hudson Theatre where the Steve Allen show was filmed, got on stage and learned all about it and just that sort of thing then of course we went to the Sullivan Theatre went everywhere in New York and um, that was the start of it basically we went, went to the Hilton and to was it the Rainbow Room where I always did the press conference I can't remember now but the Rainbow Room and I pretty much did that my first job was actually in Manhattan and um, at uh, Lieber Brothers and so literally the first time I went into Manhattan for my job at lunchtime I went to the Hilton <laughs> I had to and uh, then I got pictures taken and whatever in the Hilton. And all that sort of stuff is just, it's just so good fun. I mean, it really is a tremendous fun. Um, you know, doing that sort of thing, you know, just going to different office places. Obviously, I've been to the EP Continentals fan club, the EP, EP Continentals fan club in Florida. Uh, K. John used to run it. I know K's moved years ago. K. John got in touch with me. And uh, she knew we were going to Florida, so she gave us a map of all the other sites from Follow That Dream. And I think a lot of people have now done that. But you can go literally into Ingalls, uh, Florida, and all these different places. And of course, what did I do? I went to I went to the beach that they that they had actually made. The beach that Follow That Dream was filmed on is not a real beach. It was actually artificially made uh, for the movie. But the 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 uh, bridge where Elvis. Uh, was uh, had the fishing from that is there, and it def the road does not go anywhere. The road actually stops exactly as in the movie, and so of course I found uh, found pieces of wood that were completely overgrown, and I decided this is uh, this is in the movie where they made a John, they made obviously they made a toilet with all these pieces of wood. So of course I brought back a piece of wood from a friend, <laughs> and equally equally my friend Julian, he and I together I think, or he he managed to. Uh, before Lord of the Courts was open to the public, of course, again, we decided we would go into Lord of the Courts, so we did, um, at a time when nobody else was going in. And we stole a floorboard, so we got a floorboard uh, from Lord of the Courts, and I think Julian has that, actually. And then when I went to, uh, I went to, on business, I went to Los Angeles, and um, I, phoned, uh, I phoned Sandy Miller, the famous Sandy Miller, who, again, if, you, if she's not been on your show, you have to have Sandy on. Okay. Uh, Sandy lives in Vegas, and um, and I phoned, I called her, and she had followed Elvis all the time in Los Angeles. She got loads of photographs with him. She was in NBC TV special, and Sandy, I said, Sandy, um, I'm at Rocker Place. Um, can you just tell me? It was one of Elvis's homes in, in LA, and uh, she told me where it was and whatever. So I had this crappy little rental car, um, and of course it's all gated. It's a gated community, but I'm an Elvis fan, so I'm not the public. <laughs> so of course I just drive past all the gates. And get up to Rocket Place. And I was in my suit and everything because I was at work. And uh, I had a blue suit, red tie on, it looked pretty good. And I went in, walked right up to the front door of Rocket Place, knocked on the door, and they were remodeling the house. They were actually remodeling the house. And I said, How much has it changed from Elvis? He said, This is us changing it from the, from the way it was when Elvis. So if you go to the swimming pool, you can see exactly what it was like. And of course, the swimming pool was a derelict. And the guy was trying to sell me these massive cast iron pillars that, that Elvis had had next to his swimming pool, huge cast iron pillars. He said, I'll give you a hundred bucks. I'll give you a hundred bucks. And then of course that wasn't good enough for me. So I had to go and then steal some, uh, some light bulbs from the toilet that uh, Elvis used. So I've got light bulbs from the toilet. Nice. I think again, I gave Julian one. But the best thing was, and I realized because they were remodeling it, it wasn't really stealing it. But, uh, and I don't know where it is actually. I must look it out. Um, I should. I, I know exactly where it is. Actually, it's down the stair. Um, I stole Elvis's is um, the the house number. I stole the house. I stole the house number from the. Uh, the there was a light. There was a light at the gate to the house, and I had the number inside. And so I just unscrewed it, <laughs> took it out, and took, and took the house number. So I've got the, the house number from Rocket Place. Nice, nice. Oh my gosh. This is this is great fun. I mean, you've got to. This is fabulous. Elvis fans always do stuff like 
this. No? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned that you've met almost everybody in the Elvis world. Um, I'm curious to know what your experience was when you met Red West and Sunny West. Um, again, I met Sonny in a group, and I met Sonny in the group, and obviously I just heard Sonny talking, and I went up afterwards and just said hello to him. But, um, you know, obviously I'm a I'm a fan who lived through the uh, Elvis what happened. Um, mm -hmm. I lived through it. So when Elvis was um, when Elvis was forty. Um, yeah, you know, there was the Elvis Fat and Forty thing came out, and I thought it looked really cool. And then when Elvis, what happened? When we knew it was coming out, to an extent, we kind of kidded ourselves on that it wasn't real. You know, we we just said that, and there's no way Elvis would, would do that. And the more you read it, the more you realise, you know, it's all obviously sensationalised. I mean, Stephen Levy was a criminal, the guy who actually wrote it. Fortunately. He's, he's not allowed. He's not long. He's not. Uh, he's not uh, around anymore to sue me for saying that. But um, but the way it was presented, the way it was portrayed, was terrible. It was obviously not the way that Sonny Red and Dave Hebler intended it. But Sonny, Sonny and Red got. Um, they were they were booed at one convention we had in the UK at one time. You know, and um, um, they were they were booed. And so what happened was that. Uh, at the point where they were, um, every, every mention of their name, if you like, was was kind of booed. But mm -hmm. I love the guys, and they clearly was they clearly were uh, were very close to Elvis. And so, to me, they were incredibly relevant. They were clearly very, very relevant to um, to Elvis. And they, you know, to, so to me, the time we spent red again. It was it was at Hume's High, I think it was. I think it was at Hume's I met Red, and it was just great to meet the guy. I mean, Elvis, Elvis screwed up when he fired these guys. He was just screwed up, you know, and um, he should never have fired them. They were, they loved Elvis, and, you know, they looked after Elvis. And, and um, to me, to me, that was a big mistake by Elvis. So Red and Sonny are, 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 as far as I'm concerned, they were, they were really cool guys, and they were around Elvis, you know, and, and really looked after him. It's funny, I've, uh, I've just asked my wife to go and get the sign for Rocket Place. So I'll just hold that up so you can see it, Jimmy. There you go. Oh my gosh, I love it. So go and, go and, check, the, go and check the number of El uh, Rocket Place that Elvis, uh, Elvis lived in the Rocket Place. And go and check that, that is out. so cool. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I love it's it. It's actually hard work. Yeah. But uh, Elvis wouldn't have minded. So I think Elvis wouldn't have minded. No, Let I don't see. think he would mind it at all. <gasps> If you if you do get somebody like Sandy Miller and people like that on on the show, and I think it's a great show, and I, I really enjoy it. If you get if you get somebody like Sandy on, these people used to go to Elvis's next door neighbor's house and look over, yeah, <laughs> and take pictures of take pictures of Priscilla and take pictures of Elvis coming out and stuff like that. These guys are these guys are really crazy, you know. Wait, I mean, speaking, of, like speaking of Priscilla, have you met Priscilla? Uh, can't remember. Oh, I think I just I think we just shook hands at a fan club presence uh, event. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I did, I did. Uh, but I just shook her, just shook her hand. She's tiny, absolutely mm -hmm. tiny. Um, she's really small, and she looked great. But that was a long time ago now, so maybe be uh, ninety eight or ninety nine or something. But it was a fan club. What what every year the um, they had the fan club presence had a, a, a luncheon in Elvis week. And you'd go, and there'd be something exclusive. And I always managed to go for somebody else. I can't. I don't think I was actually ever a fan club president, but I used to go on behalf of somebody else. So I used to get somebody else. It's usually somebody in Scotland do it. I would get to go for them. And after a while, they they seemed to forget that I wasn't a fan club president. So I always got that invite. Yeah, we met Priscilla. Met Priscilla. It was just a shake hands thing. None of the chance. Right. To talk to Have them. you met any of the other women in Elvis's life? Uh, I met Linda. I met Linda um, at Vernon's house. Vernon's house. Yeah, years and years ago. Well, Linda's completely, utterly gorgeous. So Linda, Linda was, Linda was, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the best woman Elvis could have ever had. And uh, making a mess of that relationship just mm -hmm. that was. I mean, personally, she would she would have kept Elvis alive. I've never met Ginger. I never met. Uh, I met. Uh, I met. No, no, I didn't meet. Uh, I've got a picture of Anita Wood. 
I meet with my friend Julian again, my friend Julian, much bigger fan than I am. Julian got me an autograph picture of Nita Wood. He met her. I met Barbara Hearn. Uh, I met Barbara Hearn. Barbara, again, she's, uh, I think Barbara's uh, got relatives in Scotland. And so we met Barbara Hearn. I uh, met Dixie, met Dixie Lop. Um, just trying to think who else. I mean, obviously, Joyce Boba. I would love to meet Joyce Boba. I think oh, I know. I would to... love. I'm Facebook friends with Joyce Bova. Are you really? I, I would love to just talk to her. I, I have um, spoke with an author. I'm not going to give her name, but there's a, yeah. a well-known writer who has met Joyce, and she says she's very lovely, very down to earth, and yeah. a smart cookie. Like she's very mm. intelligent. Very interesting you say that, Jimmy, because obviously I don't know her. But that's the impression I get of Joyce is she was really smart, and again, probably probably uh, too cerebral for all of us. But um, uh, Joyce, I mean, that's classy, classy looking woman. Um, I thought I think Elvis was really lucky. I don't think he was lucky. So he was just. I, if you've seen <laughs> pictures of Joyce now, she's in her seventies, but she looks like she's in her forties. No, like she is I'm gorgeous. Not, I'm not. I can imagine though. I mean, looks like that you don't lose. But I said stupidly said there that Elvis was lucky, but. I, you know, that's after me talking last time we met, last time we, we talked about how beautiful I thought Elvis was, and he really was. I mean, he was stunningly good looking. Um, you know, let, let me tell you a story about this. Is, this is actually something that's uh, just come to my mind just now. There's a famous, uh, there's a famous scene, and that's the way it is, the original movie, uh, where this woman in a pink dress jumps on stage and hugs Elvis. And uh, it's actually shot from the balcony, I think it is. And the person that, that claimed that this was her was a woman called Buttons, uh, Mary Horrocks from New Jersey. From, she lived in New Jersey. And she always called herself Buttons because she used to have all these uh, buttons on her. On her uh, whenever she went to Elvis Week, she was just covering the buttons. But she claimed this was, this was her. That she, uh, she jumped on stage in Vegas. And of course, there was enormous cynics about this, but she was a lovely, lovely, crazy person. And like, I, I lived in New Jersey, so Mary, she spoke like a New Jersey woman, she talked like that. She swore a lot, I'll not swear, but she swore a lot. And uh, what happened was I met her uh, originally, I think it was probably 97 or 98, met her in Memphis during Elvis week. And Mary smoked, great, great advertisement for the, uh, how, how smoking can kill you. But Buttons was, uh, she was just great. She eventually moved to Memphis uh, just to be near Elvis. And she, uh, she, was, she was great. And um, I, I, I volunteered, I think, once to pick her up from her, from her apartment and take her to, uh, to Memphis, take her to Grissom. And in a wheelchair and got a wheelchair out and stuck it in and said, right, Buttons, you're on your own. And so I, I volunteered once to do that. And then, of course, I got the... Uh, I got people saying to me, because you soon get to know people, and, uh, hey, Ian, Buttons is looking for you. Is she? Yeah, she wants to go home now. <laughs> I didn't realize I'd taken on the responsibility of taking her home as well, you know? And so um, so this happened for a few years, actually. I think maybe three or four years. Maybe, yeah, three, three years, I think it was. Whenever I'd go there, it would be like, hey, Ian, where are you? And it's really funny to imagine this in the day in the days where the internet didn't exist really well it did but uh um communication was nothing like it is now but anyway i would get the summons each time to go and take buttons to to Grissom for the uh, just for the day she was so she'd go to the she would just go to the uh, she would just go to wrestling and hang about the, the pink shops and whatever and watch the terrible impersonators uh, in the tent and so she would do that all the time and I would get the call to take her back. And then it was, I think it was 2001. I think it was 2001, I think we, um, myself and my friend Julian went over and, or, well, obviously I still lived there. I still lived in New Jersey. And what happened was we expected to go from Buttons, we didn't get it. And she'd been taken to the hospital. She was in Baptist, I think. And we went to see her. So we, myself and Julian, we go along and say, hello, we're here to see Mary Horrocks, Buttons. And, the guy says, guy, he said, well, who are you? He said, well, friend. He said, well, she's not had any relatives or friends come to see her. Are you a close friend? I said, yeah, we're pretty close. Um, let me take you to this room. And he sat us down and said, you're aware how ill your friend is? No. <laughs> no. Well, we don't expect it to last, you know, more than a few days now. We couldn't believe it. 
this is, I mean, she'd always been terribly ill. She kept on smoking, of course, but we'd no idea how bad she was. And so we were shown into a room. And literally, she, well, we walked in, she was hooked up to all these machines, and we walked up to her, and she couldn't speak, she no longer speak. And so we, but she saw us, and she was so pleased to see us, and, and we wrote down stuff in a bit of paper, and then we said we'd come back the next day. So we went back the next day, and it was, I think it was 2000 or 2001, that's where her special, uh, special edition came out. And we went to the often to the premiere, and what happened was at Fan Club President's luncheon, they'd showed some clips, and of course, I got the video camera out and videoed the screen. And we went the, the next day and showed buttons this. And we held it up, and we, we held it, we just held up the viewfinder to her eyes. And uh, she, just, she just loved it right away, and then she threw herself backwards, and then all these alarms started going off, and the people rushed into the, <laughs> rushed into the room. And they said, right, you've got to leave now, you've got to leave now. But they then told us, they told us it was just some sort of lapse and she was okay. And so we said, right, okay, well, we've got to, we've got to now see, see if we can show her this, this movie. And so at the Orpheum, uh, at the premiere, which was the next day, I think, I managed to smuggle in this video camera that's like this size. Right. right? right that's the old days of video cameras, right? And I'll tell you how I smuggled it in. We were wearing, I was wearing shorts, so a pair of shorts, and I managed to hang it, um, just let's say within my shorts. I managed to hang it within my shorts using a combination of belts and string. So I managed to smuggle <laughs> the video camera into the Orpheum. And amazingly, I was right at the front of the, um, the balcony. And I explained to the person on my left, I said, look, I'm going to film this for a person that's in the hospital. Would you mind putting up some stuff on the, onto the wall here to cover my video camera. And I got somebody else on the other side to do the same. And I stuck the video camera on and pressed record. And it recorded an almost perfect <laughs> bootleg copy of the, of that's where it is, which nobody's ever seen. Because wow. I, only, I only recorded it for buttons. And I still got it. Um, I think I showed it uh, to some people the next night. But the main thing I used it for was to write a review. But, um, what happened was the next day, uh, we managed to uh, go to a video shop and get some leads, and we managed to hook up the video camera to the television in our room. And literally, we played the whole thing for her, and she watched the whole thing. And Buttons died the next day. So she died the next day. Oh, and, uh, oh wow. But it was incredible. I mean, so she was this fantastic, fantastic, larger-than-life, crazy Elvis fan, you know? who we managed to do that for. And of course, we just felt so good that we'd managed to achieve so much and showed buttons this. But it was- a wonderful it was gift for her. That's amazing. Yeah, oh, she loved that. She absolutely loved it. She absolutely loved it. You could see the joy. And as, as I say, she couldn't speak. But um, I think we had to show it. I think it took us about three hours to show her because she kept on falling asleep and the drugs would take over and whatever. I don't know if she saw it all, but she saw most of it. But that was a, that's a, just a classic, you know, where, where Buttons, you know, commit, life committed to being an Elvis fan, Buttons' relationship with Elvis, you know, our relationship with Buttons. It's just fabulous because you meet, you meet people like that, you meet fans like that, and they are, you know, they're just, they're just so good to meet, you know? Yes. Oh, wow. Ian, I really enjoy talking to you. There's so many other things I want to ask you. I think there may be a part three to this. Because yeah, let me, so, Jimmy, Jim, let me show you my, my scarf. I've got the scarf Okay, go me. ahead. Yeah. I've got my Elvis scarf behind me. This is the scarf that Kay Lips gave me from Indianapolis. So that's it there. Oh, wow. Go down a little let further. Just, let, me, let me flip the camera around. Let me flip it around because okay. you can, uh, you'll be able to see it not, not the wrong way around. There we go. There it is. So that's a, that's a scarf that, that Kay Lips gave me that I got from Indianapolis. So Kay got that from Elvis. And of wow. course it's green. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I was going to ask you about that, what was behind you. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, um, Kay, I mean, obviously I told you the story last time, but uh, um, it's funny because when I moved to the States, uh, I, I loaned it to someone for a while. And then, of course, it came in. I had to ship it over. And that was the most, <laughs> most precious thing was uh, was a scarf coming in from British Airways in, uh, in New York, New Jersey. You know? Yes. But yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, 
yeah. It's, I could easily put you in touch with people that are much more interested than me. And, Stop and it. Sure you're <laughs> you're yeah. very interesting. You're very entertaining. You're very articulate. I love hearing your stories. And I know our listeners and our viewers here on the YouTube channel um, are enjoying it as well. Oh, definitely, good. definitely want to get in touch with some of the people that you've mentioned. Yeah. This is this may be end up a, a series. <laughs> it's really it's, it's very interesting because some of the people that I've talked to, unfortunately, have now passed away. But I mean, you know, the people, some of the people who recorded concerts, some of the people who you know did all everything that uh, that an Elvis fan could do to go and see him. You know, the people who went to see Elvis in nineteen sixty nine from the UK. And Maria Louisa Davis, I don't know if they're around still, but uh, the Glasgow Fan Club had them uh, up to talk about Elvis. And, you know, um, to me, the fans, the fans are the, the people that made, they made Elvis. It wasn't the Connell made Elvis, it was the fans. And it's, the, it's us, it's us. We've got to pass these stories on. People have got to understand who Elvis is. Elvis is, he's not a war, Elvis is, you know. 